I've signed that deal with you. I first learned it when I was in college, back in Malawi, Africa, where I grew up. I'd never heard of that hymn before, and the first time we sang it in our college chapel just really moved my heart. And it's been one of the lovely hymns that I've enjoyed singing over the years. God's invitation to us to seek Him, and His promises that when we seek Him, we'll find Him. When we ask, we'll answer. When we knock, He'll open the doors for us. And that is what we'll be focusing on today as we look at the Gospel according to Luke in chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, you could open to Luke chapter 11. And we're going to be considering one of the most important tenets of the Christian life, which is prayer. Because prayer is very central to all that it means to be a Christian and to all of God's work. We cannot do God's work apart from prayer. When we try to do that, we quickly realize that we can't because it doesn't go very far. But when we pray, God goes to work on our behalf. And the results are incredible. We find peace and joy. We have a special connection with Him. And we see His mighty power at work in and through us. So we're going to read the first. 13 verses of the Gospel according to Luke. Luke chapter 11. Please pay attention to God's holy words. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, Say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to say before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything, because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will you, the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That is the word of God, and we pray that he will bless it to our hearts in the glory of his name. Amen. Let's bow and pray. Speak, O oh Lord, to our hearts today. Make your word live to our hearts. Show us ourselves and show us our Savior. Show us how powerful you are. And we pray, Lord, that as we leave this place, each one of us will know that we have been in the presence of the Holy God and He has spoken to us. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lord, teach us to pray. That was the request 
from the disciples to their master, to their teacher, Jesus Christ. And for me as a preacher, it kind of hurts me a little bit. It hurts my pride, it hurts my ego, because you would have expected the, the disciples to ask, Lord, teach us to preach. Right? No. They say, teach us to pray. Why? I ask. Why don't I say he would teach him to preach, to teach, as he was a, Jesus, was a, Jesus Christ was a great, masterful teacher. When he spoke, he spoke with power and authority like none of the other scribes or rabbis during his day. And the disciples were witnesses to that kind of preaching, that kind of teaching ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. But no, 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 no. They say, teach us to pray. Why? Well, they had seen the prayer life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They were witnesses to that. And as much as they would have been impressed by his teaching and preaching ministry, they were more impressed by his prayer life. We read in the, Mark, in the Gospel of Mark that, Mark chapter 1, verse 25, that he would rise up early to go and pray. Often the Lord Jesus Christ would withdraw from the crowds to go to a secluded, solitary place to pray. Sometimes he'd pray all night. Seeking communion with his Father, seeking wisdom from God the Father, seeking guidance and direction for what he was to do while he was here on earth. And his preaching ministry, his teaching ministry was really empowered and fueled by his prayer life. And that is what captures the hearts of the disciples. They said, if we could learn one thing from you, Lord Jesus, we want to learn how to pray like you do. And that cuts me down to silence as a preacher. And makes me look at my own prayer life. Can the people who know me so well, like my children or my family members or those who are close friends, can they say, we want to pray, we want to learn to pray like you pray? What about you? The people that know you so well, your husband, your wife, your children, your friends, your co-workers, can they look at you and say, wow, we want to learn to pray like you pray? Or what is the most important thing that we want to learn from you? Or for Jesus, was, for the disciples, the one that do learn to pray like Jesus. Pray. Because they saw the fruit of that. They saw the results of that. They saw the power of prayer in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which makes me, gives me pause. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ here. He's not just a mere human being. He is the Son of God. He's God incarnate. And yet, as he walked here on earth, as he did his work here on earth, he sought communion with God the Father. He sought intimacy with God the Father. He took the time to seek wisdom from God the Father in order that he may do that which will be pleasing to God the Father. And I wonder, if perhaps the reason we have so many problems in our church and our ministries perhaps are not as fruitful is because we do not pray as we want. You know, we have so many wonderful things that we go to. We want to make sure the technology works. We want to make sure we have a nice building. We want to make sure we have a good church structure and all these wonderful things. And we organize prayer meetings and we spend 20 minutes talking about praying and then 10 minutes praying. 
And we wonder why we are not being so fruitful and effective in our lives and in our ministries. In your homes, in our homes perhaps, we spend so much time talking about other things that are important, but devote very little time with any at all to pray. And we wonder why we are not growing in our faith. We're not getting victory against sin in our lives. We're not making a difference in our world. And so, in this message, really I have one challenge for all of us, and it is this. Simple. Lord, teach us to pray. Each one of us needs to come before God through Jesus Christ saying, Lord, teach me to pray. Why? Because we understand that without prayer, without God's blessing, we cannot do anything of eternal value and significance in His life. And I know there are many here who have been Christians for a long time and you may feel insulted perhaps to, to even think, to think that you are being challenged this morning to ask the Lord to pray by this young African preacher who knows nothing about life. But it is true. Was he been a Christian for one year? Ten years? Twenty years? Thirty years? Or more? We still need to come humbly before God and say, Lord, teach me how to pray. And the good news is that when we do so, He will come in power and He will work if we open our hearts to Him and say, Lord, have your way in my life. He will do amazing things that we never expect. Call unto me, He says to Jeremiah. And I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Jeremiah 33 verse 3. So try him. Test him. In earnest. He said, Lord, teach me how to pray. Make me a praying man. Make me a praying woman. Make me a praying child, a boy and girl. I want to know how to pray. I want to know how to connect with you. My heart, I give to you. When the, when the disciples asked Jesus this, He didn't waste any time. He said, when we pray, and that is very instructive too. Just the way he begins to respond to that question. He says, when, not if. Do you understand what he's trying to say there? This is a, an expectation that he has for every one of his followers. It's not an option to pray. It's not optional. It's that one of the basic necessities, one of the basic tenets of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is taking it for granted here that the disciples will pray. When you pray, not if you pray, when you pray, pray like this. And you know, he teaches them what we now call the Lord's Prayer. Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And so on and so forth. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And we have the same in Mark, Matthew chapter 6. What are we to learn here? I don't have time to go through each of the petitions in the Lord's Prayer. I wish we had more time together to really break that down and go one by one. But I'm going to attempt to look at least at the first two. So Jesus comes to them and says, when you pray, pray like this. First of all, our Father, or Father, 
Matthew 6 says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. That is the first petition in the Lord's Prayer. So, when you come to pray, the first thought on your mind must be God and His glory. And you know, in a sense, that sums up the entire Christian life, the, the entire Christian gospel. Because the Christian gospel is not about man and his need, but about God and His glory. That is the essence of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why did He do that? So that He could gather to Himself worshippers, those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. Are you with me? So the Christian life, the Christian gospel, the Christian faith is not about you and your need or me and my need, but about God. And his glory. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ is directing the attention, the focus of the disciples here to God the Father and the glory of his name. For God has exalted above all things his name and his word. Our Father, who art in heaven, may your name be glorified. May your name be exalted. May your name be lifted up on high. Above everything else, above what I need, and I'm in great need right now. But before I can even begin to bring my need before you, I want you to know, God, that your glory and your glory alone matters more to me than what I need. Is that how you pray? Is that how I pray? You know, sometimes we want to say, can we say a quick prayer? Have you, have, you, have you ever heard that? Or you may even have said that. Let's say a quick prayer. Why do we even say that? Why does it have to be a quick prayer? Sometimes we're nervous because we, we feel like maybe the people around us are going to be uncomfortable if we say, let's pray. So we're like, can we just say a quick prayer? To kind of make it less uncomfortable for them. No, let's just, guys, let us pray. And then we pray. Sometimes we say, let's say a prayer. You can say a prayer without praying in the prayer. Are you aware of that? And I wonder sometimes, how many times have I done that? I've said colorful prayers even, especially as a pastor. But am I really praying in my prayer? Am I really connecting with God? And when I pray, am I really seeking the glory of God over against my own? So first petition here, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Second petition. Your kingdom come. Very powerful. Your kingdom come. And then verse third, the third one, your will be done in Matthew chapter 6. Your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. I'm going to take those two together. Why was Jesus talking about the coming of God's kingdom as an important part of our prayers? And what did he mean? By this. What does it mean to pray, your kingdom come? A number of things. Let me just go through a couple with you. First, may your reign be present here on earth. May your power be made manifest here on earth. May the world know you to be the great king of all the universe. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. But more importantly than that is that we want people to be saved. That's really the simple meaning of that. Because the heart of man is the seed of God's kingdom. If God is not reigning in the hearts of each one of us, 
then we, 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 we can forget about the coming of his kingdom. His kingdom comes as he reigns in the hearts of men and women surrender to him. And then collectively together as we go into the world to live for him as humble and willing servants of our great king. His kingdom reigns. His kingdom is visible to all. And so we are praying actually when we pray, your kingdom come, we pray, Lord, save many who submit to your kingship. Who will say Christ is Lord. That's the first meaning. That the kingdom of grace will come and be established here on earth. That men and women, young and old, who have their eyes opened to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. As King of kings and Lord of lords, as a Savior of all who trust in Him. The second meaning is that we pray for the hastening of the second coming of the Lord. When He will truly establish His kingdom and trump upon all His enemies. And reign forevermore. The kingdom of the Lord to come. When we and all of God's children will be taken up to be with Him forever. Because we know this world is not our home. We are just passing through. through. Our treasures are laid up in heaven above. And we have a longing in our hearts. We look around and we see the sin and the evil that surrounds us. We see the ungodliness. We see the hatred that people show around us against God. And we say, we are tired of this. I'm sick and tired of this. Lord, hasten the day when your kingdom will truly be established upon the earth. Hasten the day when Christ shall be declared King and Lord over all the earth when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May that day come quickly. And may that we pray for those who are on the front lines spreading the gospel on the mission field, for example. Pastors, teachers, Sunday school teachers, those who are on the front lines seeking to advance the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And this is a unique a spiritual kingdom that is not advanced by military force, is not really supported by money or taxes, but it is supported by prayer. It is fueled by prayer. That's why we need to pray. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Because we know that we desire nothing more than the will of God in our lives and in all the world. You may want to be wondering, perhaps, like, how do you find yourself here? You, you, you just told us you're from Malawi, Africa. How did you come to Canada? I want to take a touch some time to share a little bit about that. When I was in seminary at Westminster, Theological Seminary in California. I was called by a church in Vancouver to go and be their pulpit supply for one year. Before that, two years before that, I had received an invitation to go and uh, provide pulpit supply for one summer for a church in Alberta. But for various reasons, I just felt like I couldn't go. I was, I was planning to go back to Malawi that summer for a holiday, and then you can come back to seminary. And I had other commitments during that summer, and I just felt like I was doing too much, and I was also very scared. As a second, second year seminary student, this was a big church, I think about 800 people, and I was like, I'm not, I don't think I can handle this. So I turned them down at the end of the day. Went to Malawi, Enjoy my summer. At the end of that summer, I was invited to speak at a conference in Pennsylvania. While I was there, I met some American missionaries who had been serving in Canada, ironically. And they were sharing with us together 
about the need for more Christian workers in Canada. And what they shared broke my heart. Because I had just turned down an opportunity to come, or an invitation to come and serve the Lord here in Canada that summer. And I remember being so convicted, I went back to my bedroom and I prayed, Lord, forgive me. I did not know that this is what is happening in Canada. And if you want to be served in Canada, then you have to open another door because this opportunity is gone. Went back to seminary after the conference, continued on with my studies, third year. Towards the end of that third year, I went to the church in, in our bed and said, Do you need someone else to come and to the pulpit this summer? And they said, No. And I said, Ah, oh, I blew that opportunity. But then there's nothing I could do about it. I just went on with my studies, finished uh, in my first, my first, in my fourth year. And towards the end of my fourth year, close to graduation, this email was sent to all the graduating students through the seminary administration office. It was like a Macedonian kind of call. The church in Vancouver, British Columbia, say, we need help. He said, any of the students who could come and help us. And I saw this church was in Canada. I said, yes, Canada. The Lord has answered my prayer. I rushed my bed, pray, Lord, if this is it, you answered my prayer from two years ago. Please make it happen. And I went to the computer, wrote the church as quick as I could. I'm happy, I'm available. Please let me know if I can come and help. So I went for 10 days in the spring break of that year, 2008. Spent 10 days with them. And they said, we'd like you to come and do the pulpit for us for one year. I said, sure, I'll be happy to. So I went there for one year and ended up staying seven years or so as a pastor. And God has just done wonderful things. But through life tragedies, life experiences, I had to leave Vancouver, went back to Malawi, and then came back to Toronto. <laughs> and find myself here. And in all of this, I'm wondering, Lord, what is your will for me? And my marriage broke down, and I was left a single dad, wondering, can I preach again? I don't feel like I want to go back to the pulpit ministry again, at this point. Sometimes I tried to just go my own way and pursue my own desires. Other things that I thought I could do, like politics in Malawi. And God said, No, this is not what I have for you. Go back to Canada. I came back two years ago, not knowing exactly why, except that I felt convicted. I needed to come. Long story short, I was connected with some friends uh, who are part of the Reformed Church here. And we began talking, and I told them, you know, I, I, I'm not really interested in jumping back into the pastoral ministry anytime soon. They prayed for me, I'm sure others were praying. Long story short, now I've been given an opportunity to help plant the church in Wales with the help and support of the Reformed Church. You see the power of God in that? And the church multiplication team of the Reformed Church has already committed $30,000 towards that work. God is saying, this is what I have for you. And I believe that is an answer to the prayers of many of God's children. Was my heart was not there, but gradually, steadily, God has been drawing me back to the pulpit ministry. Why? Because He wants His name to be glorified. He wants His kingdom to come. He wants His will to be done in Wales, in Ontario, in Canada, in the world, as it is done in heaven. And I come here this morning to. 
plead with you to pray with me regarding this new work. Because as exciting as it is, I also know that there will be great opposition from the enemy who is not happy to see the church of Christ thrive. He's not happy to see the gospel spread to those who need to hear it the most. So I want to ask you to pray regarding these two things. One, I mentioned to you that the church multiplication team of the Reformed Church has committed $30,000 to this work. I am asking the Lord to give us another $30,000 before the end of this year towards this church planting work in well. And I'd like to ask you to please pray with me on that. Secondly, I'm asking the Lord to give us or send us 10 families who will be part of this work to help get this work off the ground. And I want to ask you to please pray with me on that as well. That God will convict people, call people to come and be part of this work. Ten families before the end of this year. And specifically, I want to ask each one of you in your own families, if you have a family or if you're single, in your own life, to consider, this is completely up to you, consider taking one day a week to pray for this work in weather between now and December, the end of December. One day a week, maybe about nine weeks or so, from now to the end of the year, ten weeks, whatever. Just one, one day a week. Pray for us. And pray like the Lord said, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Because I believe as we are taught here, the Lord answers prayer. Prayers like that. I'm going to see to the end of the passage we read here because we're running out of time. But basically, from verse 5 to verse 11 then to verse 13, the Lord is saying, giving us an encouragement to pray. He said, when you pray, you're not just mouthing words out into the air. You're not crazy. I am listening. You're talking to me. And when you ask, I'll give you what you're asking for. When you knock, I'm going to open the door. When you seek, you will find. Because I am a good father. He says, what father would give his child a serpent when the child has asked for fish? Or a scorpion when the child has asked for an egg? And he says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so I'm asking, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, upon the work that you want to establish in well. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need more of your glory, more of your power, more of your Spirit working in and through us. Some of you perhaps have heard of the, the great revival that happened in countries like Scotland, especially on the island of Lewis. Have anybody heard about that? Okay, so let me share a little bit about that here. This is called the Lewis Awakening on the island of Lewis in Scotland. The Lewis Awakening, which is also known as the Hebrides Revival, had humbled beginnings in the Scottish islands. Two Early ladies, one was 84, old and blind. The other was 82, old and bent over with arthritis. In the village of Barbas on the island of Lewis, these two ladies agreed to pray every night for a revival in their community. Night after night they prayed and they interceded and they pleaded with the Lord for a revival in their community. After some time, unknown to them, a group of young men began praying on the other end of town. 
As the letters prayed, God revealed to them that the Reverend Duncan Campbell, who was a minister in the Church of Scotland, and at one time he was the principal of the Faith Mission Training Home, that this minister in Edinburgh would come to their town, their community in Barnes to lead them. They were excited. So they wrote to them. They wrote to him. But he graciously declined their invitation. He told them he was too busy. And then they responded. You may say you will not come, but God says you are coming. So they would hear the prayer. Sometime later, at a British convention, the local pastor suggested that Duncan Campbell should come and lead special meetings. In December 1949, Duncan Campbell finally reached the Hebrides in the Isle of Lewis to lead a series of meetings. It was at that time that God's awesome power fell on that village, bringing conviction of sin and revival. The power spread from village to village from 1949 to 1953, transforming the very life of the entire community. During that revival, it was not unusual for people to be sitting in their homes and suddenly to be overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. They would fall on their faces in disgust over their sin and they would weep in repentance. There were times when the revival spirit was so powerful that shops would be closed and church services would last several hours or even days. Prayer meetings became the norm in many of the communities in that time. Now everything that we know about this, this revival in human terms, the whole thing began with two old women on their knees before God. Do you think when faith needs a revival? Do you think Ontario needs a revival? Do you think Canada needs a revival? could begin with you, with you on your knees. Will you commit to that? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for speaking to us this morning. We don't have many words, but we simply echo the words of the disciples. Lord, teach us to pray. We're going to sing in response to God's word, sweet hour of prayer. I think it's going to be on the head, on the overhead here. Sweet hour of prayer. If you are able to stand, please stand.